to thank you both uh, for your testimony. I want to thank you for your uh, long years of service to the country. You're not Democratic witnesses or Republican witnesses. Uh, you're nonpartisan witnesses, and you have stuck to the facts, and that is as it should be. Uh, first, I want to make a couple observations about the hearing today. And um, Dr. Hill, you were criticized several times by my colleagues for your opening statement. I'm glad you didn't back down from it. Um, you're much more diplomatic than I am, I have to say. Um, anyone watching these proceedings, anyone reading the deposition transcripts would have the same impression that you evidently had from hearing my colleagues talk about the Russia hoax, that the whole idea that Russia had gotten involved in the 2016 election was a hoax put out by the Democrats. Uh, and of course, they're not alone in pushing out this idea. It is trumpeted by no one other than the President of the United States, who almost on a daily basis at times would comment and tweet and propagate the idea that Russia's interference in our election was a hoax. And of course... Briefly, Lester Hall here in New York. We want to pause for a moment to allow some of our stations to return to local programming. For the rest of you, our coverage continues with the conclusion of today's hearings of the righteous indignation we heard in the committee today when the president questioned that fundamental conclusion of our intelligence agencies. But of course, they were silent when the president said that. They'll show indignation today, but they will cower when they hear the president questioning the very conclusions that our intelligence community has reached. But we saw something interesting also today. My colleagues sought to use you, Dr. Hill, to besmirch the character of Colonel Vindman. And I thought this was very interesting. It certainly wasn't unexpected, but it was very interesting for this reason. They didn't really question anything Colonel Vindman said. After all, what Colonel Vindman said is what, what you said. He was in that July 10th meeting. He heard the same quid pro quo, the same comments by Sondland. If you want this meeting, Ukrainians, and we have an agreement about this, you got to announce you're going to do these investigations. They heard the same quid pro quo that you did. So why are they smearing him? Uh, Mr. Holmes, you testified, just as Vindman said, Colonel Vindman said, that he warned Zelensky about getting involved in U.S. politics. They don't question that. They didn't take issue with that. So why smear this Purple Heart recipient? Just like the smear of Ambassador Yovanovitch, it's just gratuitous. They don't question the facts. It's just gratuitous. The, the attack on you, Mr. Holmes, that you were indiscreet in mentioning this conversation to others. Well, I think you're quite right. The indiscretion is when an ambassador of the UU calls the president on an insecure line in a country known for Russian telecommunications and eavesdropping. That's more than indiscretion. That's a security risk. But, but why attack you, Mr. Holmes? They didn't question anything you said. They didn't question what conversation you overheard. Ambassador Sondland, indeed, didn't question what you said. He acknowledged that the one thing the president wanted to know the day after that conversation with Zelensky was, is he going to do the investigations? And Sondland said, yes, he'll do anything you ask. They don't question that. So why attack you? They didn't question your testimony when you said, um, and I think you, you asked, Ambassador Sondland, does Donald Trump give a blank, and I would like to use the word here, about Ukraine? And he said, he doesn't give a blank about Ukraine. He only cares about the big stuff. And you said, well, there's some big stuff here. Ukraine's at war with Russia. That's kind of big stuff. And his answer was, no, 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 no. He cares about the big stuff that matters to him, his personal interests, like the Biden investigation that Giuliani wants. I mean, one question posed by your testimony, Mr. Holmes, is what do we care about? Do we care about the big stuff? like the Constitution, like an oath of office, or do we only care now about party? What do we care about? But let's, let's go beyond your testimony today. Let's look at the bigger picture. What do we know now after these depositions, these secret depositions? Now, people watching at home might not know that in these secret depositions, 
which apparently no one else is allowed to hear. No members are allowed to participate. It's just secret, apparently. Sounds like it's just me and the witness. Only over 100 members of Congress are able to participate in those secret depositions. And the minority was just so um, uh, unable to participate. They got the same time they got in these open hearings. It was the same format. That was the secret star chamber that you've been hearing so much about. Um, so what have, what have we learned through these depositions and through the testimony? Because so much of this is really undisputed. We learned that a dedicated public servant named Marie Ivanovich, known for fighting corruption, widely respected throughout the diplomatic corps, was ruthlessly smeared by Rudy Giuliani, by the president's own son, by their friends on Fox Primetime, and a whole host of other characters. Her reputation was sullied so they could get her out of the way, which they did. And you're right, it was gratuitous. The president could have gotten rid of her any time he wanted, but that's not enough for this president. No, he has to smear and destroy those that get in his way. And someone fighting corruption in Ukraine was getting in his way. So she's gone. She's gone. And this makes way almost immediately thereafter. She leaves. The three amigos come in. The three amigos. Two of whom never made the connection that Burisma means Biden. It took Tim Morrison all of 30 seconds on Google to figure that out. But, but we're to believe, I guess, that in all the companies in all the world, that Rudy Giuliani just happens to be interested in this one? That's, that's absurd. The interest, of course, was in an investigation of Donald Trump's rival, the one that he apparently feared the most. And they were willing to do whatever was necessary to get Ukraine to do that dirty work, to do that political investigation. And so it began, we're not going to set up a phone call until you'd make certain commitments. That was Ambassador Sondland's testimony. The first quid pro quo was actually just getting on the phone with President Trump. And then there was the quid pro quo involving the White House meeting. And witness after witness, and none of my colleagues contested this, talked about just how important that meeting was to the President of Ukraine and why they're at war with Russia. And their most important ally is the United States. And the most important person in the United States for that relationship is the President of the United States. And if President Zelensky can show that he has a good relationship with the President of the United States, it means to his people that this new president has the support of their most important patron. And it means to the Russians that we have their back. This president, this new president who is negotiating with a far superior power that has invaded his country is going into negotiation with Putin over how to resolve this conflict. Whether he has good leverage or lousy leverage depends, depends on whether the Russians think he has a relationship with the president. And the president wouldn't give him that, not without getting something in return, wouldn't give him that official act, that White House meeting, without getting something in return. And that return was investigations of his rival that would help his reelection. An official act for something of clear value and something very important, the big stuff, as Sondland explained to you, Mr. Holmes, to help his campaign. Now, we also heard abundant testimony about the other quid pro quo, the withholding of security assistance, which no one can explain. There's no debate among my colleagues. Everyone in the NSC, in the State Department, the Defense Department, everyone supported this. Everyone. All the reviews that needed to be done to make sure that Ukraine was meeting its anti-corruption standards had been done. And they had found to meet the criteria the aid should have been released, but it was withheld and no one could understand or get a clear explanation for why until it became clear to everyone it's all about the investigations. It's all about the leverage. And if there was any doubt about it, the man closest to the president who meets with him every day, Mick Mulvaney, erased all doubt. You're darn right. Yes, we talked about the 2016 uh, election investigation. 
And yes, this was in the context of holding up the military aid and, you know, just get used to it or just get over it or whatever it was he said, because that's how we roll. Those are my words, not his. But that's the import. Yeah, there's going to be politics and just get over it. Well, if we care about the big stuff, we can't just get over it. Now, my colleagues have had a lot of defenses to all of this evidence, which has piled up day after day after day, and it's amazing. They hear you testify, Mr. Holmes, that it was clear that the security assistance was being withheld. It was clear to all of the Americans. It was clear to the Ukrainians. You testify the Ukrainians felt pressure. They still feel pressure to this day. And what do my colleagues say in the same hearing? I mean, I guess they're not listening. The Ukrainians felt no pressure. There's no evidence they felt pressure. Which gets into their next defense, which is, it's all hearsay. It's all hearsay. Now, most of my colleagues, I guess, are not lawyers. Lawyers out there understand just how wrong they are about what hearsay is, but let's just discuss this in terms that, that all people can understand. The impression they would have you take from it's all hearsay is because we in this committee were not in that wardroom with you, Dr. Hill. We were not in that meeting earlier with Dr. Bolton that because we're not in the room, it's all hearsay. After all, you're relating what you heard and you're saying it, so it must be hearsay and therefore we don't really have to think about it, do we? We don't have to consider that you have direct evidence that this meeting in the White House was being withheld because the president wanted these meetings, uh, these investigations, we can't accept that. Well, if that were true, you could never present any evidence in court unless the jury was also in the wardroom. That's absurd. They don't accept the documentary evidence, all the text messages about quid pro quos, and are we really saying, and that's crazy, and if the, my worst nightmare is the Russians will get it and I'll quit. They don't accept the documents, the few documents that we have from the State Department that weren't produced, by the way, by the State Department, where Sondland communicates directly with the Secretary of State about this investigative interest of the president. And they don't accept the documents either. I guess the documents are also hearsay. Now, it might be a little more convincing if they were joining us in demanding that the documents be produced, but of course they're not. And we know why not. Because the documents are like that one we saw on the screen, they implicate others, including Secretary Pompeo. So, of course, Donald Trump and Secretary Pompeo don't want us to see those documents. But apparently it's all hearsay. Even when you actually hear the president, Mr. Holmes, that's hearsay. We can't rely on people saying what the president said. Apparently we can only rely on what the president says. And there, we shouldn't even rely on that either. We shouldn't really rely on what the president said in the call record. We should imagine he said something else. We should imagine he said something about actually fighting corruption instead of what he actually said, which was, I want you to do us a favor, though. I want you to look into this 2016 crowd strike conspiracy theory, and I want you to look into the Bidens. I guess we're not even supposed to rely on that because that's hearsay. Well, that's absurd. That would be like saying you can't rely on the testimony of the burglars during Watergate because it's only hearsay. Or you can't consider the fact that they tried to break in because they got caught. They actually didn't get what they came for, so, you know, kind of no harm, no foul. That's absurd. That's absurd. But the other, the other defense besides... It failed. The scheme failed. They got caught. The other defense is the president denies it. Well, I guess that's case closed, right? The president says, really quite spontaneously, it's not as if he was asked in this way, no quid pro quo. What do you want from Ukraine? No, no quid pro quo. This is the I'm not a crook defense. You say it, and I guess that's the end of it. Well, the only thing we can say 
is that it's not so much that this situation is different in turn of, terms of Nixon's conduct and Trump's conduct. What we've seen here is far more serious than a third-rate burglary of the Democratic headquarters. What we're talking about here is the withholding of recognition in that White House meeting, the withholding of military aid to an ally at war. That is beyond anything Nixon did. The difference between then and now is not the difference between Nixon and Trump. It's the difference between that Congress and this one. And so we, we are asking, where is Howard Baker? Where is Howard Baker? Where are the people who are willing to go beyond their party, to look to their duty? I, I was struck by Colonel Vinsman's testimony because he said that he acted out of duty. What is our duty here? That's what we need to be asking. Not using metaphors about balls and strikes or um, our team and your team. I've heard my colleagues use those metaphors. This should be about duty. What is our duty? We are, and this gets to Mr. Hex's point, we, we are the indispensable nation. We still are. People look to us from all over the world. Journalists from their jail cells in Turkey, the victims of mass extrajudicial killing in the Philippines, people who gathered in Tahrir Square wanting a representative government, people in China who are Uyghurs, um, people in Ukraine who want a better future. They look to us. They're not going to look to the Russians. They're not going to look to the Chinese. They can't look to Europe with all its problems. They still look to us, and increasingly, they don't recognize what they see. Because what they see is Americans saying, don't engage in political prosecutions. And what they say back is, oh, you mean like the Bidens and the Clintons that you want us to investigate? What they see, they don't recognize. And that is a, a terrible tragedy for us, but it's a greater tragedy for the rest of the world. Now, I, I happen to think that when the founders provided a mechanism in the Constitution for impeachment, they were worried about what might happen if someone unethical took the highest office in the land and used it for their personal gain and not because of deep care about the big things that should matter, like our national security and our defense and our allies and what the country stands for. I happen to think that's why they put that remedy in the Constitution. And I think we need to consult our conscience and our constituents and decide whether that remedy is appropriate here, whether that remedy is necessary here. And as you know, notwithstanding what my colleague said, I resisted going down this path for a long time, but I will tell you why I could resist no more. And it came down to this. It came down to, actually, it came down to timing. It came down to the fact that the day after Bob Mueller testified, the day after Bob Mueller testified that Donald Trump invited Russian interference, hey, Russia, if you're listening, come get Hillary's emails, and later that day, they tried to hack her server. The day after he testified that not only did Trump invite that interference, but that he welcomed the help in the campaign, they made full use of it, they lied about it, they obstructed the investigation into it, and all this is in his testimony and his report. The day after that, Donald Trump is back on the phone asking another nation to involve itself in another U.S. election. That says to me, this president believes he is above the law, beyond accountability. 
And in my view, there is nothing more dangerous than an unethical president who believes they are above the law. And I would just say to people watching here at home and around the world, in the words of my great colleague, we are better than that. Adjourned. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.